Hey, how are you guys doing? Awesome. <laughs> Inga made it another week. Would Inga be interested in praying for us this evening? Okay, turn with me, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Hello to everybody online. Hi to Freddie Bear. How? Hey, yeah. Roger might be watching. Roger, it's good to see you, big guy. You guys are all welcome to text me, except if you disagree. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so tonight we're going to talk about the curious case of Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus. We're going to look at the last three verses of 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 16. Are you guys all there? Well, Maria's still looking there. Take your time, sweetheart. We have all night. My sweet Fina. You there? Okay. No, she's not there yet. All right. Well, I'm telling you. Hey, Jerry, you're going to take Maria home tonight, aren't you? Fantastic. All right, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 16. Paul says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So, now everything we covered in the Second Timothy 1 was one thought that built upon another thought that built upon another thought, until you finally get to the story of Onesiphorus, the kind of great conclusion to this whole chapter. And you know that uh, this, this entire chapter was mental preparation and motivation for Timothy on how to face the biggest spiritual warfare of his life. And this preparation, you know, it doesn't end in this first chapter, but it'll continue into the next chapter. And Paul, but you remember, Paul opens with grace, mercy, and peace from God, our, from God the Father and Jesus, Christ Jesus our Lord. He reminds Timothy of the grace, peace, and mercy that's being distributed, extended to him from God. This was the divine influence of his grace, mercy, and peace upon Timothy's heart to influence his walk in the midst of this great apostasy. And by the time you get to, you go through, you start from there, and until you get all the way down to verse 15, which is about Asia having turned their backs on Paul, which meant that they turned their backs on those sound doctrines of grace, which Christ had sent Paul to proclaim, the stage had been set for this world that Timothy was about to live in after Paul has, has died. By this point, Timothy knew that a great Roman persecution was upon them. He knew the, the great apostasy that was predicted in that first letter was also upon them. The entire church is in spiritual ruins by this point, many having been deceived by doctrines of devils perpetuated by those two former grace believers, Fugelis and Hermogenes, you might remember that, who were the ringleaders of that great apostasy. And after so many people in Asia had embraced the gospel of grace, now everyone in Asia except Timothy had fallen from grace. Ephesus had fallen, 
Everyone in Timothy's church in Ephesus was opposed to everything Timothy stood for. Colossae had fallen, Galatia, Philemon, all the churches in Laodicea, or all the, uh, everybody that was in his church in Laodicea. Iconium, Derby, Antioch, Lystra. And we talked about that last week, which meant that if they were still alive, this would mean that Timothy's own family had turned their backs on Paul. And I had another thought, too. I, you remember a while ago we talked about Paul's cloak. You remember that one? We went through the, the fourth journey. We talked about Well, the guy that was holding his co cloak was a man named Carpus in Troas. Troas is in Asia. So the, the fact that... Carpus was in Troas, meant he was part of Asia, which meant that he, like everyone else, had turned his back on Paul. So even the guy who was holding on to Paul's cloak for him while he was in prison had turned his back on Paul. And you remember how Paul famously wrote in the fourth chapter, Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. You remember that verse? Well, the fact that Trophimus was in Miletum meant he was part of Asia, which meant that he, like everyone else in Asia, had turned his back on Paul too. Trophimus wasn't just physically sick, he was spiritually sick as well because he had deserted Paul in all those sound doctrines of grace. When Paul left Trophimus in Miletum, he must have been heartbroken because he was both physically and spiritually broken, having spurned his apostle with whom he had labored for many years. And now Timothy is completely alone on this entire continent. And all of this points to the fact that this letter, I think, is not about Timothy's timidity, but rather this letter is about the intensity of the spiritual warfare which would intimidate even the most courageous soldiers of Christ. And you might remember how we pointed out last week the, the lies, the smear campaign, and the threat of persecution at the time by the Roman Empire that was so intense, it was designed to make Timothy terrified about his faith, ashamed of his faith, and silent about the gospel, or else you might die. And here Paul is mentally preparing and motivating Timothy for intense spiritual warfare that would continue for the rest of his life and some 300 years after, afterwards. And Paul opens this chapter with the reminder about the, fundamental of, the fundamentals of what all this was about, the salvation of souls, the promise of life in Christ Jesus, which he mentioned in that first verse, which was the promise that God had made to himself before the foundation of the world, which he kept secret until it was revealed through Paul in what he called that mystery. This promise of life was vested in Christ Jesus, who was to pay the death penalty for us all so that eternal life might be offered to all by grace through faith. Life in Christ Jesus, life in immortality, is now brought to light by the gospel, by which we are called by God to trust in His Son's sacrifice and resurrection as a payment for all our sins, so that His death may become our victory. And then Paul reminds Timothy of the happy sincerity of his faith as a child. That childlike faith as a child, the unfeigned faith, the purity of faith he had in God without any doubts. And for Timothy, we know that that unfeigned faith he had as a child was because of his mother and his grandmother. And you can just imagine that if his mother and his grandmother were dead by this point, then that verse would have this enormous emotional impact on him. And you remember he tells Timothy in verse 6 to stir up the gift to inflame in his mind the empowerment of God's grace given to him to fulfill his calling, because he would tell Timothy in that next verse, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, which is the empowerment we all have by his grace. One cannot be empowered by his grace unless one has been established in his word. Knowing full well his identity in Christ, what God has made him in Christ. Knowing how to appropriate that power and the fruit of the Spirit. Knowing 
how to deal with people in grace, how to properly engage in spiritual warfare. This gift of God's empowering grace to fulfill his role as a spiritual leader first required Timothy to be nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine through mentorship. And then he also had to be constantly in his word, constantly meditating upon his word, constantly in prayer, constantly walking in the spirit, constantly keeping that sin-corrupted body under subjection by his, to his uh, regenerated soul, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And if Timothy failed to do all these things, he'd be neglecting the gift that was in him. He'd be neglecting the empowerment he possessed within himself by God's grace, the strengthening of his grace that made him able to excel in his role as a spiritual leader. And he was reminded to have no reason to fear because God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Paul is saying that God hasn't given us the characteristics of fear, but he's given us the characteristics of power, the characteristics of love, the characteristics of a sound mind. So the result of being in this empowered spiritual state as a mature believer is that he also would not therefore be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of Paul as prisoner. The mature believer with a stirred up gift exhibiting God's power, love, and, 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 and a sound mind, Christ's sound mind, would not therefore be ashamed of that testimony of the Lord. And when you're that empowered by His grace, you're, you would logically never be ashamed of Christ, of Christ, nor of His message of grace given to us. And then he tells... Timothy, to choose to suffer for Christ's sake. Be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, he said. And this is a crucial aspect of spiritual leadership, particularly in Timothy's position, because you, you have to understand the nature of spiritual warfare, and that leader has to be not only willing to engage in that warfare, but he also chooses to suffer the afflictions of the gospel. Because of the intensity of that spiritual warfare is such that the world is telling you that if you take a stand for the gospel you will suffer then you must choose to suffer but if you choose to suffer you'll be able to say as paul said but but our light of for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory one of the great contrasts in all of Paul's writings, the lightness of our afflictions contrasted with the exceeding eternal weight of glory. Glory so incomprehensibly exceeding it has eternal weight to it, which I love. And then Paul would write in verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And, you know, we covered this a couple of weeks ago. We get that connection between the cause of his apostleship to his suffering, and we're given this example in that Paul is still not ashamed of the Lord or of his gospel of grace. And you see, we see his willingness to entrust the eternal destiny of his soul into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had committed his body, soul, and spirit to Christ. He had committed his eternal life to Christ. He committed all of his happiness to Christ, all his love and joy. <coughs> Pardon me. In Christ was that life in which the apostle had participated. In Christ, he had all the power that sustained his life. And in Christ, he knew he would be preserved unto his heavenly kingdom. And here, Paul is at the end of his life, his impending death a certainty, and his eternal security an even greater certainty because he knew the character of our Redeemer in whom he had committed the eternal destiny of his soul, which is why he had no reason to fear. He had no reason to be ashamed of anything. And the apostle speaks of his eternal destiny in the face of death with a kind of holy triumph here. For I know whom I have believed, which is to say I stand on the firmest possible ground. I know the divine faith and the integrity of the one in whom I have placed the eternal destiny of my soul. And we covered last week even more instructions for Timothy as he enters into this 
severely intense spiritual warfare. We had in verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words. And then we had in the next verse 14, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. And you remember, Timothy, like all of us, are to hold fast to that entire package of grace while we perfect our walks, conforming ourselves into the image of Christ. We hold on to these sound grace doctrines in faith and love. We, we hold on to it in faith, a living faith and a living God, taking God at His word because God is the one who, who said it. And we hold fast to these doctrines of grace and love as well because these doctrines are not just head knowledge, but they are heart application as well. It's the, the life of Christ living out of us with His love shed abroad in our hearts. And we cling to that truth and faith and love and we never, ever let go. Which brings us to verse 16. The bright, shining example of Onesiphorus, whose name means prophet bearer. And the prophet here was the refreshing of Paul's soul by coming to visit him. Now he says in verse 16, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain, but when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So before I get into mercy, I want to talk about the fact that Paul said that Onesiphorus was not ashamed of my chain. This is the third time Paul would emphasize this point in this chapter. Um, so I thought it was interesting. He told Timothy in verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner. Instructions to Timothy to never be ashamed. And then you have in verse 12, Paul's demonstration of his own spiritual leadership by showing that he is not ashamed, despite the circumstances and naturally every evil thing that's being said of Paul while he's being kept in prison. He was resolutely immovable from the power and the glory of the gospel of Christ, and he would not be ashamed. And then we're given here at the end of the chapter this example of a man Timothy knew well in Ephesus, Onesiphorus, who may very well have risked his own life to find Paul in Rome because he too was not ashamed of Paul's chains. And I don't think Paul emphasized three times this point about not being ashamed because of some flaw in Timothy's character. As if, uh, you know, I don't think Timothy was one who was prone to being ashamed of the gospel, but rather I think he had an enormous amount of courage. And this is, and this is more about the intensity of spiritual warfare that was designed to make everyone ashamed of Paul, ashamed of everything Paul taught, and thus they were uh, I don't can't think of the word. Thus, they were pretty much terrified to be say anything about the gospel because they may very well have to suffer consequences for that. And Paul is saying essentially, do not ever let them do that to you. Do not ever be ashamed of the gospel. And I also think that Paul saying of Onesiphorus that he was not ashamed of my chain is connected to what was said about Asia in that previous verse. Because I think all of Asia was persuaded to be ashamed of Paul because of his chains. You know, if Paul was arrested and convicted by Caesar Nero, then he must be guilty, right? <laughs> As if Paul had never been wrongly persecuted and tortured for preaching the gospel of grace before. As if there wasn't any corruption in that Roman government at all as if Nero couldn't possibly have any ulterior motives for that sham of a trial to condemn Paul as a scapegoat for his own crime of starting a fire in Rome so he could build that golden palace, as if Nero couldn't possibly hate Paul for converting much of his own household to Christianity when he viewed himself as a Roman god. <laughs> I remember even Tacitus, the historian, possibly senator, in that book, The Twelve Caesars. I still remember what he wrote after, after he, pers after he uh, martyred Paul and he was persecuting the Christians. Tacitus said that in the city of Rome there arose a sentiment of pity due to the impression that the Christians were being sacrificed 
not for the welfare of the state, but to the ferocity of a single man. Now, the next point I want to go into was the fact that Onesiphorus had to search diligently to find Paul, which is why I have myself a fancy chart up here and a PowerPoint presentation tonight. Um, now, it, makes, it would make sense to me that finding Paul would not have been easy. Actually, I have a picture. <laughs> it was working when we were praying. There we go. Now, wouldn't be hard to find Paul in all that mess, would it? Um, now this, and I think I know what the problem might have been too. During Paul's first imprisonment, you might remember in Acts 28, it was said that it was, he was in his own hired house. So the thinking might have been, well, I'll bet he's in another hired house all over again because that's where he was last time. So then Onesiphorus probably went all around the city to all these hired houses in order to try to find Paul, which was uh, something that took a diligent search day in and day out until he could find him. And, he, and I think what had happened was, was that he eventually learned he was not in a hired house, but he was in a prison. Now, interesting thing about the Roman, uh, the city of Rome, they did not have any prisons for these people. They had, they had houses, they had uh, complexes, apartment type structures where the criminals would stay until it was time for them to go to trial. But they did have one prison in that city. Only one, and it wasn't just any prison, this was the Mamertine prison. Um, now, let's Oh, come on. <laughs> you are working so well. Hey, Mike, you want to go back there for me? On the right laptop, hit the right arrow for me. I don't know what the problem is. Technology at its finest. Now, you see the right arrow? <laughs> uh, so the Mamertine prison, we'll talk about that while he's going there. John told me, Pastor John did the Footsteps of Paul message, or Footsteps of Paul tour. So this is the, uh, that was then. This is a model of old Rome. Uh, that's the Roman Forum right there in the middle. Now, when he took the, the tour, he went to the Mamertine prison, which is right in the heart of Rome. And he said that, well, tradition says that Paul went to this prison. There you go. Stay there. Stay there for me, and uh, um, I'll go to the next one. Now, this is the um, and this is the heart of Rome. This is this is the, uh, back then. This is the Roman Forum. This is basically a bunch of temples and a couple of government buildings. And in that upper corner there, you see the Mamertine Prison. It pre now this was it, it actually predated the city of Rome. It was a, this was a used to be a cistern before Rome became a city. It was just a big tank for the holding of water because uh, I guess it was near or above a spring. And then when Rome became a city, they turned that into a prison. And it's, a, it's actually a very famous prison, and it's still there. And f take, for example, if the Roman Empire would conquer this certain region, they would maybe take the leader of that region, like the king, and then they would bring him to Rome. And you remember how they would lead captivity captive, parading this king around in the city in celebration of conquering this region. And then that parade would end at the prison and they would take that king or whomever into the prison and they would kill him and dispose of the body in that prison there. It's a very famous prison. Um, this, the, this is the prison for VIPs. Go to the next one for me, Mike. Now, I'm going to show a bunch of pictures uh, from the Roman Forum and to just get a, a sense of bearing, I'm going to start with the arch of Septimius Severus right there. Um, go to the next one for me. It's still there. It looks like this. Um, go to the next one, uh, Mike. That's a big, big archway, right? It says uh, uh, Severus, Septimius Severus was an emperor. It was a, uh, a hundred, couple hundred years after Paul. This is to celebrate his victory over the, uh, uh, the Parthians, I think it was. Um, I actually read years ago when I was really into this, I read uh, Edward Gibbons' Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. I don't recommend it. It was extremely tedious. Uh, but my favorite part, the most memorable part, was that Severus's two sons, when he died, took over, and they had joint emperors. At the, the only time they had joint emperors, there wasn't any drama having two emperors over Rome at all. They weren't trying to assassinate each other. Go to the next one for me, Mike. Um, 
All right, so now we're going to look at digital reconstructions of the Roman Forum from this perspective. So essentially, you're going to be facing the Arch of Severus, and then behind the Arch of Severus, you're going to see all these temples, which are temples to Roman gods. And on the right the Basilica Amelia, which is a basically a big government building. Um, and then on the left, you have a kind of a sister building called Basilica Julia. Basilica is, uh, I think it's called, uh, it's a tribunal chamber for the king. So essentially, it's possible that his trials could have taken place inside one of those two basilicas. Um, go to the next one for me, Mike. Now you can see here, you see the, you see the arch right there in the middle. Um, right behind it are the temples of the Roman gods, the Basilica Amelia is over there on the right. Uh, next one for me, Mike. Um, this is another angle. The, uh, the, 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 ar the arch is on the far right there. Behind it, you can see all the temples. On the left there is the Basilica Julia. Next one, Mike. Um, another angle. See right there, there's the arch, the triumph, the temples behind it. Now, the arch did not exist at the time that Paul was in prison. This was added later, but everything else was there. And so what, uh, this is what Onesimus would have seen on his way to go find Paul in prison. He would have gone through this forum. He would have gone through where that uh, arch is. He would have gone up the hill a little bit, and the, and the prison would have been right there on the left. Um, go to the next one for me, Mike. Another angle here. Um, that's the Basilica Amelia there on the right. You can see the hill right behind the uh, arch there. Next one. Um, here's... I'll show you at the end of it, it shows you what it looks like today. Um, here's a, a picture, of a, a rendering of the arch and all of those temples behind it. Next one for me, Mike. Uh, same temples, except it's almost like in this recreation, it's on steroids a little bit, really, really big. Um, next one for me. Now, uh, here's the, I'm going to show you what the Basilica Amelia looked like, and only because I think this might be where his, uh, his trials could have taken place. Next one. Um, Big, beautiful building there. Uh, next one for me. Um, there's a model of it. Um, next, uh, next one, Mike. Now, there's the Basilica Julia on the other side, another beautiful building. Next one. Um, looks like that. I just, it's gorgeous. Um, next one, Mike. Okay, so we're going to look at a painting from the perspective of in which we're facing that temple of Caesar, and the Amelia will be on the left, and the Julia will be on the right. Next one. Um, Notice all the colors in the painting here. It wasn't, the city of Rome wasn't all white. It was actually very colorful. They had a lot of those, a uh, um, lot of painting that was over those buildings. Okay, next one, Mike. Now we're going to look at the prison uh, up here. Uh, next one. That is where the prison is now. Now, you notice on the left is the, is the arch, right? You remember the arch? And it's right behind it, up a hill. And this building in the center, the prison is on the first floor, but they built a church above the prison. So with the church that's above it, just ignore that. Next one, Mike. Um, as we move in a little bit closer, there it is on the left. You can see the Mamertinum um, uh, uh, heading there. Next one. Um, there you go. They actually added um, a reference to Peter and Paul above the name because uh, it's thought that both Peter and Paul went to this prison. Um, Paul, I, in my mind, Paul definitely. Peter is probably up in the air. Next one, Mike. Now, this is the this is the act. Now, this is the, there's four floors here. The top two floors are are the church, but that third floor and the fourth floor on the bottom was just the prison. Next one, Mike. Now. The third floor, which would have been the top floor during the, during the time of Rome, it's on that floor that they would have kept the prisoners while they went through that trial and while they were waiting for a verdict. Um, next one, Mike. And here's the top floor here. So you can see the stairs coming from the street level. Um, there's a little altar there, kind of a memorial for all the famous people that had been in the prison. And uh, the right, right on the left here, there's a little stairwell that goes down. That's something they added years and years later. That used to not exist. You see that hole in the center of the, of the room? Well, when you were found guilty, they will put you down in the hole, and you, could not, you would not ever come back out again. Um, and uh, so when Paul, I think, wrote Second Timothy, I think he was in that room. Um, next one for me, Mike. Yeah, here's the, there's the hole. Very big emphasis on the whole. Next one, Mike. 
Now this is the now this is the chamber at the bottom. So if you were a Roman citizen, you had the uh, benefit, the privilege. If you've been found guilty and worthy of death, you were because you were a Roman citizen, you were entitled to the benefit of a private execution. So they put you down in the hole, and in that hole they would they would behead you. Um, and uh, so I told John, I said, you weren't just in the prison where Paul was held. You were you stood on the very ground where he was beheaded. And you see that hole at the bottom of the of the of the lower chambers when they uh, that's how they dispose the body. They would put it in the they would dump it into the sewers after that person was beheaded. Next one, Mike. Um, there you go. The only light coming into that room from the hole above. Next one, Mike. Um, now down there in the in that lower chamber, they've got another memorial for uh, Paul and Peter. You see the upside down cross. Um, it's not meant to be blasphemous. There's the history records that Peter insisted on being crucified upside down. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's why they have that there. Um, next one for me, Mike. Another angle of the altar. Next one. How big is that hole? Uh, manhole cover, basically. And that's, that's what it looks like now. That's all that's left of it. You've got the arch there. And you see those columns there? Those are from the temples of Roman gods. And right in the middle there is what's left of the Basilica Julia. Um, so I thought that would just be sort of interesting. Now, back to Onesiphorus. Um, and I'm done with the PowerPoint, Mike. You can come back. Although I should have made him sit back there and just anticipate the rest of the night. Now, consider this point. First, consider the fact that when Paul met the elders in Acts 20, you remember that? You know, those elders not only loved Paul, but they wept when he left, and they fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, you remember? And here we are with 2 Timothy. We're roughly two years after his release from his first imprisonment in Rome. And now none of those saints loved Paul anymore. They had all turned their backs on him, except for one man, Onesiphorus, right? Whom Timothy knew really well. And Onesiphorus, you know, he clearly from these verses, he had lived in Ephesus at the time that Paul spent those three years there. And Timothy knew already of the many ways that Onesiphorus had ministered to Paul. Um, and in the Greek, long story short, ministered to Paul meant that he acted like a deacon. He acted like a servant. He... He basically attended to Paul's physical needs with great care. And at some point it would seem to me that Onesiphorus and his family moved to Italy outside of Rome. And I say that because in the last chapter of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.19, Timothy is instructed that when he travels to Rome, he's to also salute Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. So they must have moved to Italy, and they lived somewhere outside of Rome. And I also think that because Paul said, when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently. So this had to mean that he must have lived outside of Rome. He had to travel into Rome, and then he had to travel from place to place, day in and day out, until he finally found Paul. But the bigger point is that when all the other Ephesians turned their backs on Paul... Onesiphorus refused to be ashamed of his chains. He knew what was really going on. He still loved Paul, and he did something about that love at a time when Paul needed him the most. And I'm sure there were still many out there who loved Paul, but how many of them loved Paul enough to risk their lives to go find him in Rome? And when Onesiphorus found him, he oft refreshed him, Paul wrote, which meant he kept going back to see him, and their time together refreshed his bowels, you know, his inner being. Just as when Paul told Philemon, you know, when he said, Our bowels are refreshed by thee, brother. And here we have on display the real power of the fellowship of the mystery, the refreshing of the soul to be in contact with a fellow saint of like-minded faith coming to your coming to your aid in a true spirit of love in your darkest times. And you know, Paul told the elders in Acts 20 that the Holy Spirit had made them overseers of the flock at Ephesus. You know, they were like shepherds over their flock. 
And we know that a good shepherd would go to the ends of the earth to find that one lost sheep, right? But here, we have the story of one of the sheep searching to find a lost shepherd. And when he found him, he oft refreshed him. Onesephorus, in all of his visits, did more to encourage Paul than all his enemies could discourage him. And Charles Henry McIntosh would say of Paul here that he was cheered by the individual devotedness of some who, like mighty men through the grace of God, were standing faithful amid the wreckage of the church. So then we have two prayers for mercy here in these three verses. And then there's a big question hanging over it all as to what happened to Onesiphorus. Because it seems like something happened here. Did Onesiphorus lose his life because he sought Paul out? I know, well, let's consider all the evidence. You have in verse 16, he says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus. Well, to me, that's a big red flag right there. Something must have happened for him to want that prayer for that family. Now, when Paul says the house of Onesiphorus, I don't think he means Onesiphorus and his household. I think he means just the household of Onesiphorus. And I say that because I, you know, Paul had a second prayer for mercy for Onesiphorus himself in verse 18, when he said, The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. So you have here two prayers for mercy. You have one for his household and one and a separate prayer request for Onesiphorus himself. And in fact that there are two similar but different prayer requests for Onesiphorus and his family to me seems to suggest strongly that something serious had happened, which is why he expresses separate prayer requests for Onesiphorus and his family. Now, some have suggested that once Onesiphorus found Paul, you know, he may have brought his family to visit him, which may be why he prayed for mercy for his his family, as if to say, well, I hope the entire household gets some blessings from the Lord since they all came to visit me. But see, I don't think that's the case. These verses, to me, give a, gives us no indication that his family visited him. In verse 16, he says, For he oft refreshed me, but when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. So I don't think his family went to visit him at all. So if Onesiphorus was the only one in his family who visited Paul, why would Paul pray for mercy to the house of Onesiphorus? Is perhaps Paul being gracious by saying, well, I don't want his whole, saying basically, I want his whole household to be blessed because of what Onesiphorus did for me. And I don't think that's the case either. I think Paul wants the Lord to influence the hearts of his family with mercy because something very bad happened to Onesiphorus. We don't know what, but somehow, some way, Onesiphorus spending so much time with Paul cost him his freedom and I think would ultimately cost him his life. And many have pointed out, in, in, as I mentioned earlier, 2 Timothy 4.19, you know, the instructions of Timothy to go to Rome and when you're in Rome, salute Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. He'll only be visiting the household of Onesiphorus because Onesiphorus won't be there because he's likely in prison and he'll likely be put to death. Now, why is that? I don't think he was, you know, I don't think he was dead already, but I think his arrest now makes his fate inseparably entwined to Paul's fate. Whatever happens to Paul will now happen to Onesiphorus. He was basically guilty by association for knowing Paul. Or his arrest may have just been happenstance, you know, the whims of Roman authorities on that day just decided to lock up Onesiphorus as well. And if Paul is going to be put to death for his faith, then it's likely that Onesiphorus will be put to death as well. So why does Paul want his household to have mercy from the Lord, was my question. Well, for, I think it's for the same reason Paul told Timothy in the opening of the letter about the grace, pe- grace mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. In that expression, Paul was declaring the distribution of grace, mercy, and peace upon Timothy's heart to influence his walk, because these letters were written during a time in which that whole church was in ruins. When the Roman Empire was about to begin this 
empire-wide spread of persecution against the Christians. And Paul also had in view in these letters the great apostasy in the, in the last days of grace. And during the times of great apostasy and great persecution, we must forgive others because Christ forgave us. And we have to show mercy because of the mercy Christ has shown us. And we display grace to all because of the grace displayed to us. And we be at peace with our persecutors with, us, with as much forbearance as lieth within us. In times of persecution and great apostasy like what Timothy was experiencing, we show mercy. As Paul you know, illustrated in Romans 12 when he said, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. We recompense to no man evil for evil. And he says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. So if the, the enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We show mercy and grace to those who persecute us and leave vengeance in the hands of the Lord. This was God's design in His grace program. Mercy is compassion, and the family of Onesiphorus needed the influence of God's mercy upon their hearts in order for them to show mercy, to show compassion to those who wrongly killed their father and husband. Forgiveness and mercy would release their hearts from a lifetime of bitterness and hatred for the wrong that would be done against Onesiphorus. And then we have the, the Paul's second prayer for mercy for Onesiphorus himself. He says in verse 18, The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So Paul here has something very different in mind. He wants Onesiphorus to find mercy of the Lord in that day. Now what the question is, what day is that day? I think Paul is assuming we already know what day he's talking about, so the answer must be in the context. And I suspect he's talking about that the same day he mentioned in verse 12 I read earlier, you know. Um, I'm going to skip to the last half here. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Well, what day is that? <laughs> I mean, the day of our redemption. You remember what, what Paul told the Ephesians, ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And what takes place on the day of redemption? It's what takes place in Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And it's at the rapture that I suspect that the judgment seat will take place because of 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Until the Lord come, that is when he'll bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and then every man shall have prayer, have praise of God. Now Paul's prayer for Onesiphorus, to me, is prayer for a man who will soon die just like him. And his prayer is that the Lord will show him compassion at the Bema seat when he gives out those eternal rewards because of the fact that Onesiphorus ministered to him in Rome and also because of all the ways he ministered to him and all those years he spent at Ephesus. Mercy shown at the Bema seat would simply be less of a loss of rewards compassion shown by the Lord to that believer at the request of others because of his or her extraordinary blessing in some way. And so my question was, is this a prayer we can make for fellow believers today? Can I pray, you know, God, can you show mercy to Mike Moriarty because he's just the most awesome roommate I ever had? You know, well, why not? I see no reason not to. You know, some have suggested that this could be an apostolic exception, but I, I can't think of any verses that would support that idea. How can it hurt? The thing I love most about this prayer is that it's a prayer of grace, showing grace in our prayers, grace in our prayer life. 
well wishing for our fellow believers at the Bema Seat. And you know, Paul essentially returned kindness to Onesiphorus in the only way he could by praying that the Lord will show him compassion in eternal rewards at the Bema Seat because of what he did. Paul repays him kindness with his prayers, through his prayers, which the Father will consider. Now here's another thought. His family lost what may have been their sole breadwinner because Onesiphorus went out hunting for Paul. So would it be considered somewhat re reckless that he risked his own life and the well-being of his family because he loved Paul so much he just had to see him in Rome? And could that also be the reason why Paul asked for mercy at the Bema Seat, I wonder? Because maybe he might lose rewards for this. His, his prayer for his family may not simply be mercy to those who did wrong to Onesiphorus, but that that mercy may be directed toward Onesiphorus himself for leaving them. Now, I'm going to close with this. Anybody have any thoughts? I'm a couple minutes over. I'm going to close with this. I'm going to quote Pastor John Fredrickson in an article he wrote in uh, 2014 in the Searchlight about how one person can make a difference. He said only <laughs> Jashashiba, Jashashiba, only Jashashiba hid young Joash from being killed, enabling him to become a godly king and keeping the line of Christ from being snuffed out. 2 Corinthians Kings 11 points out that Elijah stood alone against hundreds of false prophets and a wicked king and queen. Jonathan alone protected David from the murderous plots of Saul in 1, Timothy, 1 Samuel 19. Nathan stood alone to rebuke David, influencing him to get right with the Lord. God used one man, Paul, to reveal our new dispensation of grace, and he used Onesiphorus to encourage Paul in a time of great trial. God can also use you to make an important difference in your sphere of influence. Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, seeking to make a difference by ministering to others. Does anybody have any thoughts they want to share? Uh, thank you very much. I love you. I'll pay you after after we're over with. Um, yeah. Oh. Oh, I know. It's big, isn't it? That's a big place. Mike Moriarty. Yes, yes. And I think about Paul, mm. and I say, you know, there were times where Paul could have renounced the Lord Jesus Christ, and probably would have made his life a lot easier. <laughs> and here, people that have walked away have never been confronted with Paul's situation. Yeah, yeah. And Paul knew, he knew um, in, in uh, I think it's either First or Second Timothy, where it talks about we can deny the Lord, but he cannot deny yeah, us. Yeah, that's right. Paul We're coming could, on that verse. Paul could have used grace as a license to live any way he wanted to. Mm -hmm. He could have turned that around and said, Lord, listen, I'm saved, but I'm choosing yeah. to feed my flesh, <laughs> and I'm not going to. And I don't know if anybody here has ever had a thought about, and I've thought about this, if, if it ever got so bad for Christians here and somebody was holding a sword over my head and said I need you I want you to denounce what you believe in or we're, I'm going to cut your head off <laughs> I don't know if anybody's had that here well, but you know I don't know what I, I know what the new man would do well, you know, but the flesh and, and the point is Paul, <laughs> Paul understanding the doctrine could have made it easier on yeah. Him. oh yeah uh, in fact, uh, Hal, uh, Hal and I were talking about this very thing, you know, the uh, 
the beheading of Paul, that's not a bad way to go, you know? <laughs> you know so, I mean, because these other Christians were uh, put, put on fire and stakes in the Colosseum, and there's a, a lot of stuff that could have happened, but the beheading was not a bad deal. Uh, so if somebody had a sword, I might, I might be even more inclined to uh, uh, praise the Lord even more. <laughs> No, 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 I need you to pay rent, brother. Um, and you and I saw you bought ice cream sandwiches too, so I I can't cut Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's uh let's close in a word of prayer. Our wonderful heavenly Father, thank you so very much for you know the example of Onesiphorus, the the depths that you give us in three verses and how much we can Rejoice over how he refreshed Paul, how it inspires us to make a difference in the lives of the people we know. And I just pray that his story will work in us, inspire us to help others, especially those going through very difficult times. And that what we do will all be done to glorify your Son, our Savior, who died for us, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.